All right, let's now talk about estimating confidence intervals for the mean of a population based on a single sample size, and we'll just look at some examples. In the last section, we defined a 95% confidence interval for the population mean, mu. And we said the interval was actually given by taking our sample mean and adding and abstracting two standard errors, which were computed by taking the population standard deviation of individual values and dividing by the square root of the sample size. But of course, we don't know that population value standard deviation of individual values, what we call sigma. We can actually estimate that, as we know, though, from a single sample as well, with S, the sample standard deviation, such that our estimated standard error for the sample mean is given by S over the square root of N. And then we can estimate a 95% confidence interval for our population mean based on a single sample size N by taking our sample mean and adding and subtracting two estimated standard errors. So suppose we had blood pressure measurements collected from a random sample of 100 students, Hopkins students actually collected in September of 2008. And we want to use the results of the sample to estimate a 95% confidence interval for the mean blood pressure of all Hopkins students in September 2008. And what we get are a sample mean of 123.4 millimeters of mercury, sample standard deviation of 13 millimeters of mercury. So we can estimate the standard error of a sample mean based on 100 randomly selected subjects from a larger population by taking the sample standard deviation of 13, dividing by the square root of the sample size, square root of 100, and the square root of 100 is just 10, so that becomes 13 over 10, or 1.3 millimeters of mercury. So a 95% confidence interval for the true mean blood pressure of all Hopkins students, based on this data, we take that sample mean of 123.4, plus or minus 2 times 1.3, which would ultimately give us a confidence interval from 128.8 millimeters of mercury to 126.0 millimeters of mercury. So recognizing the uncertainty in our estimate, gives us a small but real range of possibilities for the true mean. And we may at some point want to do this study again in a different month and do the same analysis and then compare the confidence intervals from two different months to see if there's any evidence of a systematic shift in blood pressures, like, say, in December when everybody's taking final exams and such. And we'll talk more about comparing populations in later in the course. Here's another Example, data from the National Medical Expenditure Survey, and this was done in 1987. This is a United States-based survey administered from the Centers for Disease Control in the U.S. Here's some results comparing mean 1987 medical expenditures for those in the sample with a history of smoking and those with no history of smoking. So if anybody had ever smoked at any point in their life, they're considered to have a smoking history. And you can see, if you go down to the last row for the ends, it was about 6,500 to the 5,000 with no smoking history. So over half this sample actually had some history of smoking. So you can see the mean medical expenditures in 1987 for those with a smoking history were about 2,260 U.S. dollars as compared to 2,080 U.S. dollars for those with no smoking history. And the standard deviations were... 54,850 US dollars and those with a smoking history and 4,600 dollars with those with no smoking history. So now let's just go ahead and compute confidence intervals for the medical expenditures by smoking history. If we do it for the group with a smoking history, we take that sample mean plus or minus two standard errors, which we'd estimate by taking that sample standard deviation of $4,850 and dividing by the square root of 6,564, which was the sample size, we get a confidence interval that ranges from $2,140 to $2,380. And for those without a smoking history, do the same operation, we get a confidence interval that ranges from $1,950 to $2,210. So after accounting for uncertainty in both these estimates, despite the fact that the samples were large, there was a lot of variability in the individual level data. The sample standard deviations were high, so our standard errors were fueled by that as well. But it's interesting to note that if you look at these confidence intervals for the two groups, there is some overlap. That is, the upper bound in the confidence interval for the mean expenditures among those with no smoking history 
is larger than the lower bound for the same interval on those with the smoking history. And what we're going to see in subsequent sections is that this crossover suggests that after we've taken sampling variability into the picture, it's hard to ascertain whether there's a real difference in the underlying mean expenditures in these two groups because of that crossover in the range of possible values. So this is just foreshadowing, but what we're seeing here is a difference that is not statistically significant because once we've accounted for uncertainty in each of the groups being compared, we don't see a clear distinction in the range of possibilities for the underlying mean medical expenditures. Here's another example of confidence intervals in action. The effects of lower targets for blood pressure and LDL cholesterol level on atherosclerosis in diabetes, the SANS randomized trial. This was a 2008 article published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And their objective was to compare the progression of subclinical atherosclerosis in adults with type 2 diabetes treated to reach aggressive targets of low-density lipoprotein cholesterol level of 70 milligrams per deciliter or lower and systolic blood pressure of 115 milligrams mercury or lower versus standard targets of LDL cholesterol of 100 milligrams per deciliter or lower and systolic blood pressure of 130 millimeters of mercury or lower. So in other words, what they're doing is they're actually making the standards stricter and trying to see if that helps with the progression of this disease. So what they did was they did a randomized open-label blinded to endpoint three-year trial from April 2003 to July 2007 at four clinical centers in Oklahoma, Arizona, and South Dakota. And they had 499 American Indian men and women aged 40 years or older with type 2 diabetes and no prior cardiovascular events. So the population in which they're studying are American Indian men and women vis-a-vis a sample of 499. And what they did was they randomized to the aggressive versus standard treatment with step treatment algorithms defined by both. Here's just some results that they give, and this is taken directly from the article. Mean target LDL cholesterol level and systolic blood pressure levels for both groups were reached and maintained. The mean and 95% confidence intervals for LDL cholesterol in the last 12 months were 72 with a confidence interval of 69 to 75 and 104 with a confidence interval 101 to 106 milligrams per deciliter in the aggressive versus standard groups respectively. And then they give the same analyses for the blood pressure. So let's just look at what they have there. You can see that the sample mean of 72 in those on the aggressive therapy is lower in value the sample mean of 104 for those in the standard therapy. And then if we even, after we account for uncertainty and put ranges of possibilities for the true post-intervention cholesterol levels for those in each of those groups, there's clear separation there. And this is what we call a statistically significant difference, which again we'll more formally describe, define in later lectures. And you can see that this presentation of confidence intervals is not something I've made up and pulled out thin air. This actually occurs in a lot of the literature when summarizing the results from a study and trying to make a point here. So this gives some evidence, what we just talked about, to some possible efficacy of the aggressive approach to arteriosclerosis management compared to the standard approach in this population based on the results from the study, which incorporates sampling variability. And I just highlighted in this picture here the two that I quoted in that previous results section. But there's many more for you to check out. Now, how can we get Stata to help us out here? In the last example, the confidence intervals came to us with the article, but in the first two, we had to compute them ourselves. And we, if we have Stata, we should never have to do any adding or multiplying by hand ever again. So it turns out Stata can help us create confidence intervals easily if we come to the table with the same numbers we were looking at. All we need is the sample size, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation, and it'll do the work for us. So if we go back to example one, the blood pressure of 100 Hopkins students, we had a sample mean, 123.4 millimeters of mercury, a sample standard deviation of 13.7, and a sample size of 100. And the syntax of this command, CII, is you type the word CII, 
then give the sample size, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation in that order. And CII stands for confidence interval immediate. It means you're going to bring summary measures to the table and state is going to be a calculator. And you can see in those last two columns there, it gives the endpoints for the confidence interval that correspond to the ones we had actually gotten by hand.